All right. I believe we are live. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, let me bring over everyone into this session. Good. And uh, welcome back, everybody, for day three of the conference. I uh, can't believe we're can't believe we're here already. Um, another action-packed, uh, delightful day of talks coming up. I am very excited about everything that we have we have coming up. We've got six uh, six wonderful talks on the program for today, uh, but. First and uh, and foremost for the day, we have our third keynote speaker. I am extremely, extremely excited to uh, to welcome Susan Hunston from the uh, University of Birmingham from the uh, English Language and Linguistics program there, uh, who's going to talk to us about uh, uh, language and the construction of knowledge in the scientific community. So really, this is, I was just saying when we were, when we were in the uh, sort of have a uh, getting getting everything connected time. Uh, I'm really excited to build uh, to build this link in particular. I think I think what linguists are up to recently is extremely cool. There has been some phenomenal research going on that 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 I'm really excited to get to know a little bit more about and I hope you are too. So without further ado, please, uh, please take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you, Charles. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good middle of the night, uh, everybody. It's a great privilege um, to be able to take part in, the, in this conference. Um, I'm going to be talking about language. Um, I'm going to be talking about some ideas about language that predate digital approaches. And then I'm going to update with some um, uh, some of the more recent work on digital approaches to investigating science. Um, so there are two ideas that I'm going to talk about first, particularly. One is a, 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 an area of linguistics called systemic functional linguistics and the contributions that that has made to the, to the study of the language of science. Um, the second is a notion that I came up with uh, many years ago on, on epistemic status and the contribution that I think that might make. Um, and then I'm going to take three study, case studies that build on the notion of epistemic status. But after that, we kind of meander a bit um, into this project on uh, interdisciplinary discourse. Um, and I try and um, expand the ideas presented to you a bit. So the idea of systemic functional linguistics, it was developed by Michael Halliday. There are some references at the bottom of the screen there. It sees language as social semiotic. I'm going to talk a bit about transitivity, about a key concept in um, SFL called grammatical metaphor and how that contributes um, and can be quantified in a corpus of scientific discourse. So a little digression, first of all, into what is grammar. Uh, I heard a definition recently that it was, it was something that provides uh, a model of how language is best represented in the brain. And for many people, that's what it is. But for many other people, it is different. It is a model that provides the best account of how society construes the world. So it can be seen either of as, as an account of structures and constructions, or it can be seen as an account of systems of meaning. Now, systemic functional linguistics, language as a social semiotic, is the social side of this. So for people who do this, uh, grammar is a model based on evidence, that provides the best account of how society construes the world. And it doesn't have much to do with people's brains. Um, and grammar is an account of systems of meaning. When we look at transitivity, Halliday proposed looking at verbs and accounts of things that happen as being broadly belonging to three kinds of things. It sees the world as things that happen, things that people do, things that animals do, etc. It sees the world as mediated through thought, perception, words, the things that people say or think or observe or feel, and the world as relations between things, people and qualities. 
So examples of things that happen are the cat, the child kicked the ball, the ball sailed through the air, the window broke, the parent scolded the child, the child cried. The world mediated through thought, perception and words might be she told the child to stop, the child saw the window break, the parent loved the child. And the world as relations between things, people and qualities are examples such as the child had a ball, the ball was red and black, the window was made of glass. So three different ways of construing um, the world. Now, for many, mo a lot of the time, nouns are the things that construe people and things. And if you look at that the other way, people and things are construed by nouns. Verbs construe processes and processes are construed by verbs and circumstances are construed by adverbials and conjunctions. And when those things happen, this is what Halliday calls congruent grammar. In other words, the grammar kind of matches our experience of the world. But when we have something called grammatical metaphor, the nouns construe processes and circumstances and the verbs construe relations between processes. For example, Here's an example I picked up uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, from the magazine, The New, New Scientist. It's a question and answer in their question and answer page. Uh, many birds are able to remember and mimic sequences uh, of songs they hear, including human speech. What evol evolutionary advantage does this give them? And the answer is the evolution of the advanced ability to mimic the bird song of other species is usually driven by sexual selection. Um, then we have an example of the superb lyrebird um, with who has a sophisticated repertoire of songs and sounds. Now we'll look at the bits in bold there. Many birds are able to remember and mimic sequences of sounds they hear the evolution of the advanced ability, etc., is usually driven by sexual selection. If we take the first of that, this is, this is congruent grammar. Many birds are able to remember. The nouns are many birds, birds are things, they, they refers to the birds. Sequences of sounds, not quite a thing, but close. And then the verb phrases are to do with remembering and mimicking and hearing. So basically doing things. But if we look at the metaphoric, the noun phrases here are for one thing very long and the main noun is not a thing, but an abstraction. Um, the evolution, something evolves, the ability, something is able to do something. Uh, sexual selection, one um, animal selects another. Uh, biological fitness, somebody is fit. So those nouns are coming from verbs or from adjectives. The exception of that is birdsong, um, which is uh, the name of the thing. And then the verb phrases here are not about some, something doing something, but the relationship between ideas. So um, uh, evolution is driven by sexual selection. Sexual selection causes evolution. That's the relationship between them. Um, the ability signals greater biological fitness. It gives us the idea, it shows greater biological fitness. So it shows the relationship between the two things rather than somebody doing something. And one of the great things I find great fun to do is changing metaphoric to congruent or vice versa. So we have the advanced ability to mimic bird song. If we make that more congruent, we would say some birds are able to mimic bird song very well. The evolution of the advanced ability might be some birds have evolved so that they are able to mimic, etc. 
then it, then it starts to get a bit more difficult to know what the correct translation would be. Sexual selection, I presume, is something like birds select the partners they want to mate with. So the evolution is driven by sexual selection becomes because birds select mates, some birds have evolved so that they are able to mimic birdsong. And greater biological fitness, um, I guess, is something like some birds have more robust genes. But we're starting to move quite a long way from the original. But we could paraphrase the original metaphoric statement um, in, by putting together all those congruent bits. So it would be the evolution of the advanced ability becomes some birds are able to mimic birds on very well, gives them the appearance of having better genes. And at this point, I'm starting to become quite creative in deciding how to paraphrase um, the original. But what I'm essentially doing is changing those abstract nouns that construe an activity or an ability, changing those into the verbs and then moving the other nouns around them. The, if we look at the differences between the two, the metaphoric version, as you will have seen, is quite inexplicit. The congruent version is more explicit. You have to add a lot of information to make it congruent. The metaphoric vision, version is shorter. My congruent version was longer. Um, the metaphoric version is also probably more difficult to understand, and there's evidence that, unsurprisingly, children grasp congruent grammar before they grasp metaphoric grammar. Um, but all those things are really sort of stylistic things, length of the sentence, whether it's difficult to understand or not. What also is important is that the metaphoric version construes entities which are central to biology evolution, sexual selection, biological fitness. These become things, they become entities in biology. Um, and biology works by treating these entities as things and working out how they fit together. So as Halliday proposed, grammatical metaphor is central to the development of a science. Now, Halliday did that work um, many years ago uh, and before it was possible to quantify this except on very small amounts of text. So you could work through text and count the different kinds of clauses. Um, but more recently, of course, with corpus linguistics, we're able to do this on much larger uh, collections of text. So Biber et al. and other colleagues um, at uh, Northern Arizona University have worked a lot on this um, in the context of clause complexity and noun complexity um, and looking at really the kind of noun you get um, in these texts and the amount of um, pre modification and post modification of the noun phrases. So if we look at something like the advanced ability to mimic the bird song of other species, that's got pre modification advanced and post modification to mimic the bird song of other species. And in the examples I'm going to show you, they compare registers, they compare conversation and academic writing, and they measure progress um, through the university from first year undergraduate to postgraduate. So here are some results from comparing registers. So these are the language features on the left. This is the average per thousand words in conversation and the average per thousand words in academic writing. And you will see that the things that are associated with long noun phrases attributive adjectives, modifiers, post modifiers with of, post modifiers within, they are all more frequent in the academic discourse. Whereas the things that are associated with more clauses are more frequent in the conversation. 
And if we take the second example, uh, comparing levels uh, from first year undergraduate to um, level four postgraduate, again per thousand words, these Asian nouns are nouns that end with things like uh, T-I-O-N, Isiti, Nus, all the things that are suffixes that make verbs in English into nouns. So those kinds of nouns, the adjectives, the noun modifiers and the post modifiers with of, they all increase in relative frequency um, from level one to level four. So all of this is um, kind of confirming without actually having started from Halliday's point of view, nonetheless, what they've done is confirm the importance of grammatical metaphor. Um, in academic discourse. Um, so you, we might say one of the conclusions of this is that um, heavy use of grammatical metaphor is indeed an indicator of academic style. But as I said before, it's more than, as it were, just style. Um, the nominalizations, the use of these particular kinds of nouns impose objectivity and they remove agency. They distance the science from the scientist or they distance the scientist from the science. And those nominalizations become the entities that make up science. Now I'm going to turn to the second idea um, and, and this is the notion um, of epistemic status. So this idea is that every proposition in any kind of discourse is evaluated in terms of its epistemic status. That is the nature and strength of its alignment between that proposition and the world. And sometimes the status of a proposition is by default. It's not actually signaled. So here, here are some examples of different kinds of sentence, if you like. The first one is from a novel, prize for anybody who can tell me where it comes from. Um, directly, I began to cross the common, I realized I had the wrong umbrella, it sprang a leak, the rain ran down, etc. The second one is from a newspaper, a forest fire in a sparsely populated area 50 miles north of Tokyo continued to burn yesterday. The third one is from the same newspaper, but a different part of the newspaper from the opinion pages. The psychodrama engulfing the Scottish National Party is remarkable for a party that prides itself, etc. The next one comes from an academic paper, regression analyses were run. And the last one comes from the same paper. The learners in the two studies were very similar in L1 age, aptitude and learning context. And one way of thinking about this is to think, what happens if you disagree with the statement? What does a challenge to the statement mean? Because they mean different things. So a challenge to the first one, the novel, is, is kind of irrelevant. There is no point saying you did not cross this common, the, the, you did not see Henry. This is a novel. It's not supposed to fit the real world. It creates an imaginary world. So it, it's, there's no truth value um, there. For the second one, if you wanted to say this is not true, it would essentially be you are lying. There is no forest fire 50 miles north of Tokyo. The next one, you um, a challenge to that might be, um, that's your opinion, I don't agree. I don't agree there is a psychodrama engulfing the SNP and I don't agree that it's remarkable. But it would be different from saying you're lying. It would be a disagreement. The next one, again, if you were to say this is not true, regression analyses were not run, the consequence would be a lie. But the final one, if you said, no, the two learners are not, the learners in the two studies are not similar in L1 age, aptitude and so on, um, 
This would not be your lying. This would be, I disagree with your interpretation of the two cohorts of students. So they're very different. And one thing that strikes, struck me when I was working on this was how important ep epistemic status seems to be to people, just ordinary people. And um, there's a couple of examples here. Uh, there was a nature program on British television which showed polar bear cubs in a den. And there was a tremendous furore in the newspapers because it turned out they weren't filmed in the wild, they were filmed in a zoo. Um, and people, that, so there was a bit about what the epistemic status of the film was. And then um, I don't have time to go into this second uh, example in great detail, but it was basically a book that was written about the experiences of a child in a concentration camp during the Second World War and whether it was fictional based on true events or whether it was things that had actually happened to the writer of the novel. And again, tremendous fuss caused by which of those um, it was. But I'm going to move on now because where this becomes relevant in digitizing this, the, the, what I've just talked about, that epistemic status can only be, it's a manual process to classify those, those um, instances. But here we start to get status being marked by words like show and idea and observation and implication and finding and likelihood. And these are the nouns, the verbs, the adjectives that mark status um, in English. And they can be put together to construct a web of knowledge. So here we have an example of a, a proposition, all living organisms on this planet are descended from a single organism. And this is labeled in three different ways, as suspicions, as evidence, and as fact in the adjective clear. And so we have a single sentence that tracks us through how this proposition was arrived at as being currently accepted. And I'm going to miss that bit out and that bit. Um, so it's the a word alignment between word and world. A word there means it's the alignment as stated by the writer. It's not, I mean, we're not talking, we're not getting into the philosophy of truth here. Um, when writers write, what status they confer is a matter of choice. So the choice to call something a suspicion or evidence or a fact is a matter of choice. It may be marked or unmarked, but it's always there. And that incidentally makes status different from other related concepts. And status entities are, again, the building blocks of science. So they're about the thing that science is, as well as expressing opinion and that kind of thing. And when this has been quantified, what is quantified is these markers of status because you can't quantify on large amounts of data the default status, or at least I haven't found a, a way of doing it. Um, so one example is a, a paper written, um, several papers, but I've just, I've just picked one, comparing a corpus of dissertations in material science and political science. So we've got the difference between physical science where writers build on previous discoveries and political science where um, previous arguments are reinterpreted. Uh, Maggie Charles took the noun plus that course clause pattern, so words like argument, conclusion, discovery, evidence that are followed by that clauses, the argument that, the conclusion that, the discovery that, and so on. And she divided those nouns into different kinds. So the kind that um, express ideas or arguments or evidence or possibility. Um, you'll notice that there are many more instances of these in politics than in materials. These are averages per 100,000 words. And that politics has more of the idea and argument and materials has more 
of the evidence. She then also said, what is it that's being evaluated? Is it the writer's own ideas or other people's? And in politics, it's mostly um, the other people's ideas and in material science, it's mostly the self. You see those, I've lost my cursor, but there it is. You can see the um, items in bold. So typical examples from political science is um, the assertion that nationalism and patriotism are inc incompatible causes complete confusion. What's being evaluated here is somebody else's idea being evaluated as incorrect. The typical example from material science based on those figures is that uh, something that has been done provides good evidence that the bonding of the QD layer to the substrate is, is excellent, which is an evaluation of the writer's own, own work, own filing, findings. So this is one indicator of um, the representation of evaluation of propositions. We see the difference in the disciplines and these are consistent with other accounts of differences in epistemology between physical science and social science. Now, my second example is a um, piece of work that was done on a book called The Rough Guide to Evolution. Great book if you don't know it. Um, and the author was kind enough to give me a probably illegal um, text readable copy of the book uh, from which um, I selected those verbs that are followed by that clauses. So this was a simple task of all the instances of the word that, look to see um, the verbs uh, that came before them, um, which I did a simple categorization into what is known and what is thought. So what is known, verbs like show, what is thought, words like argue. Um, also called a verb alignment or potential alignment. So this is true or this might be true. I also um, categorize the subjects of those verbs as being a person or a non-person, uh, a thing, a finding, um, an, an experiment, whatever. Looked at the relative frequencies of each and came to the conclusion um, spoiler alert, that uh, what this writer is doing mostly is saying man or person proposes, nature disposes. People come up with ideas, nature tells them whether the ideas are right or not. So these are the, the figures. If we look at the verbs with the human subject, we'll see that most, the larger quantity, um, indicate potential alignment. Whereas if we look at the non-human subjects, the greater quantity is a verb alignment, not potential. And if we look at individual verbs where you can have either one a subject, so you can either have Darwin showed or you can have Darwin's experiments showed, um, then where the verb is a verb alignment, the, it's more likely to be a non-human subject. Where the verb is potential alignment, suggest and assume, it's more likely to be a human subject. So looked at both ways, um, you get the same result. So again, what does this mean in terms of the typical? Well, if you have human subject and potential alignment verb, you get something like Hutton was amongst the first to suggest the earth is much older than biblical accounts allow. And if you get a non-human subject and a verb alignment verb, you get either something like these findings show the Rift Valley did not represent a barrier or fossils show the Rift Valley Valley did not present a barrier to chimpanzee occupation. Um, and this is, this, so this pattern of person suggests findings show um, 
is repeated, as the figures tell us, this is repeated throughout the book and gives us, although it's a popular book, it does follow what you might call a standard scientific view of how things are done in inscribing, ascribing uh, the construction of facts to human ideas and then objective, non-personal subject evidence. Now, the third example is my longest example, and it's the most recent. Um, and it comes from a project carried out on interdisciplinary discourse um, by a team led by Paul Thompson um, at the University of Birmingham. And I've put at the bottom um, uh, a reference to a book that Paul and I published last year with Routledge. Um, and I've also put a little reference there to Sketch Engine, uh, which is the um, corpus environment where we did uh, a, a lot of the studies for this, in case I forget to mention them again, because they helped us enormously um, to do this study. We built a corpus with the cooperation of Elsevier publishers, and we used um, journals that were published by Elsevier um, on the general topic of environment. Um, we had what we call the B11 corpus, which was 11 journals um, from, uh, sorry, that's not quite true, but never mind, almost true, from 2000 to 2010. Um, we also had the B4 corpus, which was four of those same journals from 2000 to 2010. And we focused particularly on one journal called Global Environmental Change. And we had access to that from 1990 to 2010. So Global Environmental Change is one of those 11, which is why I said that's not quite true. Um, these were the people who were working um, on the project. and. Um, I'm going to go in a little bit more detail now about the B4 corpus. So this was four journals, um, plant science, uh, a journal about agriculture and environment, global environmental change, and a journal on uh, economics and environment. And we selected those four because two of them are broadly about physical science and two of them are more social science-y. Um, two of them are single discipline, plant science and REE, and two of them are um, interdisciplinary, um, AEE and GEC. And we determined the nature of the discipline using Elsevier's own way of mapping journals and disciplines. We undertook a lot of different methods uh, from the qualitative to the quantitative or if you prefer from the text based sitting reading things on a piece of paper um, right the way through to the highly quantitative digitized methods um, including topic modeling uh, which was the subject of the uh, plenary talk yesterday. Um, but I'm going to start with uh, carrying on with the study of status markers um, because uh, I was able to undertake uh, a study of status markers, um, nouns, verbs, adjectives in the B4 corpus. Um, many of them were unevenly spread. So for example, 66% of the noun perception is in GEC, 82% of all the instances of um, deduced uh, is in plant science. 60% of assumption is in the uh, economics journal. Um, and through a, a, bit, a bit of not very clever statistics, um, looking to see uh, which of these words were very distinctive of particular journals, um, it was then possible to quantify the number of distinctive status markers. And You've got this at the bottom of the screen. And really the only thing to notice here is that GEC, this inter interdisciplinary journal is the most distinctive. It has the most status markers that are most, most frequent um, in that journal. 
Um, if we look at the status markers that are distinctive, that are very frequent in one of the journals, not the others, um, the physical science journal, Plant Science, um, its markers relate to the empirical research process, um, things like analysis, confirm, determine, hypothesize, indicate, observe. In the economics journal, you've got distinctive markers relating to the mathematical research process, assumption, belief, conclude, etc. cetera. Um, AEE, the agriculture journal, actually doesn't have many distinctive markers, but they seem to relate to judgments about the future, recommendation, estimate, prediction, and so on. And GEC, the most distinctive one, has uh, markers related to research theories, um, so not so much, in that case, not so much processes, but theories, ideas, notion theory, human thought and communication, agree, believe, decision, opinion, risk, danger, risk, threat, um, research processes, and reflexivity, which I'll come back to in a moment. And if we compare the observation, the word observation, which is about what you see, what is a lot the what you see is aligned with the world, the proposition is aligned with the world. Um, this is more common um, than the word argument in three of the journals, but the word argument, which is I am constructing something, I'm not looking at something, I'm explaining, interpreting, theorizing about something, that is more frequent proportionally in um, our social science interdisciplinary journal. Um, interestingly, observation turns out to mean not quite what I thought it might mean, um, because observations can be the foundation of knowledge, as in these examples from plant science. So it's things like the observations indicate that, the observations agree with, the observation is, uh, is evidence of, the observation is taken for granted and it's a foundation of other, of, of other uh, parts of knowledge. But in these other journals, observations are part of a debate. So if we look at this example, consistency with Herder's observations, you get the observations of non-scientists that are brought into connection with the observations of scientists or the measurements of scientists. You get this rather curious example, um, the one above it. Um, some evidence supports the observation that organic fertilizers diminish herbivorous insect populations, which is kind of odd because it suggests that that observation about organic fertilizers is only temporary until you get other evidence to support it. And then the final example on that screen is um, something which you might say is not an observation at all. The fragmented nature of social science research is um, an opinion, really, uh, but it's been labelled here an observation which gives it um, a higher epistemic status. Um, and we can look at things like the, the adjectives that come in front of argument, um, and in particular, contrasting the domain related arguments, um, economic argument, scientific argument, which are used when talking to people outside the discipline in these interdisciplinary uh, journals, as opposed to these specifying arguments, which are very discipline internal. The acid growth argument, the guilt argument, the indignation argument. You have to know the discipline to know what those things are. And one interesting contrast between the two interdisciplinary journals is that if you take something like scientific arguments, um, the agriculture journal, the sciencey one, usually takes science at face value. So are there scientific arguments in favor of domestic support to agriculture? Whereas the GEC um, examples are questioning scientific arguments, uh, the validity of scientific arguments 
is up, is up to for dispute. Um, scientific arguments pretend to be value free, but kind of aren't. And this led on to us looking at what we call disciplinary reflexivity in the GEC journal. Um, because it would appear that writing for an interdisciplinary audience can focus attention on the notion of the discipline. Disciplines are mentioned, compared, commented on and challenged in the interdisciplinary journals much, 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 much more than in the monodisciplinary ones. So one of the very qualitative studies that we did was simply reading the introductions to the articles and having examples which are conciliatory in the first set. So is there a dichotomy between indigenous knowledge and scientific knowledge? No, there isn't. Um, we who do social science should be cautious in moving too far from the philosophy and structured experimental approaches that characterize science. Or they can be, these introductions can be antagonistic. Um, something cannot be adequately understood relying on science alone. Positive science, which pretends to maintain the position, back to this notion of science not really being as objective as it pretends to be. And if we look at just those words, science and scientific, you will see here how vastly more frequent they are in the GEC journals, journal than in any of the others. So a science journal like Plant Science PS here doesn't talk about science or scientific very much at all. Uh, sorry, those figures are per million words, those averages. Um, and we can follow that up. Um, but I'm going to turn now to uh, topic modeling, which we also tried, tried out, not, not really a standard procedure in our field, but we decided to do it. And I don't have to tell you what it is because the excellent paper yesterday by Christophe Malater gave you all the detail that you need to know. Um, I'll just add though, that something that we did was a, a bit different is we had a much reduced stop list. So we didn't try and exclude all grammatical words because we believe that grammatical words are useful contributors to topics. Um, we worked with 50 topics um, and uh, I was interested to hear that Christophe also, they, they, it was trial and error. You know, we looked at 10, 20, 30, all the way up to 100 and we settled on 50. But the most important thing we did differently was that um, instead of working on whole texts, we split everything up, split all our files up into text chunks of about 300 words and then to the next of the end of the paragraph. So you're talking about two or three paragraphs, not whole papers. Our results was we found topics that occurred in particular places in the paper and we could do this because of our method. We looked at topic change over time. One thing that I think was particularly interesting, although I'm not going to talk about it today, is there were papers that had a lot of a particular topic in them um, and other papers that had a broad spread of topics. So this seemed to relate to the notion of being you know, the single focus paper or the broad discussion paper. And um, we had to try and classify what kinds of topics we were coming across. So these were some of the topics that we had. Um, and you see, we said well, some of them to do with the natural world, some of them to do with people, some of them to do with um, political things. And you'll see here how the reduced stop list introduces some grammatical words here and then really quite odd things like more than, less, not, greater, which we said were actually part of the research process. So this is the, the part of the paper that brings together the empirical research. Uh, again, just some ex um, examples of um, topics that we found um, from GEC, from Global Environmental Change. Um, and one interesting 
thing that we could see was that the same words or the same kinds of words occurring in more than one topic. And so indicating how when they were in different papers, they gave you a different sense of what that thing is about. So I've said that extremely, <laughs> extremely incoherently. Um, this is part of the problem with, with this topic modeling, that these topics are not actual things and you have to kind of interpret what a great long list of words actually means. So agriculture can occur in the context of crop production, soil, food, yield, increase, fertility, use, plant, which is a sort of industrial agriculture, I guess, or agriculture as part of um, the human activity of farming, raising cattle, livestock, pasture, etc. And then right down to what you might call the local or household level um, with this topic here, um, where it's so you feel you're going from the more um, industrial to the more personal household based view of agriculture. So there isn't a single topic that is agriculture, but there are these nuanced um, topics. And another thing that was very apparent was that a lot of the topics had human involvement in natural entities. So the topic that had the word river in it also had irrigate and irrigation. Forest had conservation. Sea had flood and impact. So the, the, the way that these entities are being construed in the papers are in relation to human involvement. And then there was a, a predominance of risk and mit mitigation. So again, a lot of topics which included a natural thing like water and stress, environment and problem, see and protect and loss. So risk and mitigation in relation to natural entities. And we had topics that, coming back to the notion of discipline reflexivity, that included knowledge um, in, their, in their list of words. This is just an example of how we showed topics that changed in frequency over time. Um, so this set of topics was very prominent in 91 to 95 um, with uh, planning and agenda at the top. But here we're having to give a single name to a topic, um, which is in a sense a bit, uh, um, it's very subjective, the, the, the name you give um, to that topic. Um, that's just showing you that it can be done, I suppose. Incidentally, you'll see here that we've got these things that we call topicy topics, and then these other things. And the other things are to do with research processes, whereas topic topicy topics are to do with the content, the thing they're actually talking about. Now, I want to um, now diverge really from what I said I was going to talk about because I did just want to introduce this other thing that we used in that project, just because it is um, a common digital um, procedure to carry out. And I thought it might be of interest um, to the men, uh, participants in the conference. And it's the use of something called multidimensional analysis um, developed again by Biber, the same Biber as I mentioned before, first in 1988, but then in many publications since. Um, the, the way this works is that a corpus is tagged using um, features of grammar and lexis, and the corpus will consist of different registers. Factor analysis is then used to cluster those features, um, positive and negative in each factor, and the factors are interpreted semantically or stylistically, and they're given names which are dimensions. And then the registers um, in the corpus are compared along each of the dimensions. And what Biber showed um, was that if you look at two things like conversation and academic discourse, as we saw before, they will 
differ from each other more or less depending on which dimension you take. Um, and uh, so that's the way that Biber did it. Um, we did it a little bit differently because um, when we looked at a particular journal, we didn't have ready divisions within that journal. So if you've got a corpus that's made up of different registers, you obviously compare one register with another. Our corpus was made up of different journals. And one of the things we did was to compare the journals with each other, obviously. But then we also wanted to see if we could, from the bottom up, derive groups of papers from within a single journal, rather than start off by saying, we're going to divide the, the papers in this journal into different groups to start with. So we did that by obtaining the dimension profile for each paper. And then we clustered the papers based on the dimension profiles. And we got what we called constellations because we were running out of vocabulary at this point. So this is just to give you an idea of this. Um, these are the features that the corpus is tagged with. This, is, this comes from um, Biber's tag set. And in fact, he helped us um, to do that. Well, he helped us to do it. He did it. Um, he, he tagged our corpus for us um, using his um, own tagger. Um, and you'll see it's an eclectic a set of features um, that include um, some grammatical things, sorry, uh, some grammatical things and some other things. So you've got, uh, for example, verb, the uninflected verb, um, you've got the word the, but you've also got semantic categories like activity verbs. You've got first person pronoun, which is very, very clear, um, but things like cognitive nouns. So this was one of our dimensions. So these things are brought together by the factor analysis. And then you have to interpret what that means. We did that partly by looking at the list, but also by reading the papers that had high loadings, positive or negative loadings. And the interpretation we came to was that this dimension is at the positive end system oriented and at the negative end action oriented. Um, so the high scoring papers are not about action, they are about descriptions of systems, models, abstract concepts. And low scoring papers are oriented towards actions, what people did at particular times. Here's an example from a higher scoring paper and the features that are in that list are in blue here, the, the abstract nouns, the determiners um, and the other things there. And if you just glance at that, you can see that it's, it's an abstract paragraph. This is a lower scoring paper. So uh, it has some high scoring features, some of the high loaded features, sorry, uh, in blue, and some of the negatively loaded features in red. And this is about somebody doing something, um, essentially. The constellations, we ended up with six constellations. Um, and you can see here, it's the um, statistical outcome of the analysis on each dimensions. So cluster one, for example, has 118 papers in it. And the average for the paper along each of the uh, dimensions, one, two, three, four, five, six, are shown there um, in those uh, boxes and whiskers um, uh, presentation. And then again, your job is to look at those and think, well, what does it all mean? And this is what we thought it all meant. Um, that constellation one are papers to do with quantification and measuring, constellation two to do with uh, governance and management, um, and so on um, through our six um, constellations. 
There was diversions between constellations. So the ones that diverged most were one and five. So constellation one has a focus on the physical. Argumentation is implicit. Um, it talks about specific sites of human environment interaction and there is quantified data about changes in the environment. Constellation five focuses on the abstract. The argumentation is explicit. It gives you human perspectives on the environment and social perspectives on physical science. So within this interdisciplinary, paper, uh, interdisciplinary journal, we can identify these sets of papers that are a, take this different perspective on, on the topic of environment. Um, we've done it through calculating um, the co-occurrence of the features. Um, so this is an example from Constellation One, and it's about um, things that happen in particular places. And this is from an example from Constellation Five, um, which is about the personal and about human beings uh, reacting with the environment. So our constellations were partly about style, but they were also about content. What are these papers about? We could then do other corpus searches um, and, and calculations, um, looking, for example, at the collocates of the word environment. So we looked at minus to plus three collocates of environment in Sketch Engine and in Constellation One, um, it's obviously quite a long list, but in red, you can see the uh, collocates that are about the natural world, features of the natural world, the environment. Constellation five has some of those, and it also has some other things that are the same, like um, departments and DEFRA and things like that. Um, but also in green has these words that are um, about the, hu uh, the human react reaction to the environment, human interaction with the environment, protecting, having a campaign, care, protect, responsibility, um, and so on. So that is what I have been talking about. Um, I've talked about the way that language studies um, tell us about style. Uh, they tell us about the distinctive features of a particular kind of writing, the relative frequency of particular linguistic features. And these stylistic features are essential to the maintenance of communities of practice in science, um, as people like Highland have said. Um, but I think it's important that they also constitute the things that make up knowledge. Um, I've talked particularly about the nominalized processes, the evolution, the fitness, the selection that are the things that make up knowledge, but also labels for all knowledge entities, those epistemic status words like arguments and findings and evidence. I talked a bit about how ideas that came up uh, before digital methods were widely used um, have continued to uh, be tested out and quantified digitally, but also how we've been able to use data-driven and quantitative methods um, to come up with new ideas as well. That's the end of my talk and um, my slideshow has some references on it as well. Actually, I'll just leave that one up. Fantastic. Thank you so much. This is, this is really neat stuff. Um, I am going to once again, take chair's prerogative while we wait on uh, on questions to come in through Crowdcast as people as people collect their thoughts. Uh, since I get since I get a little bit of a, of a preview, thanks to the tape delay, um, I wanted to ask about something that I'm sure you're thinking about because it 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 sits just behind so much of this of this work in the in the Global Environmental Change Journal. Um, it seems like in some sense, one of the things that your methods letting you see in a very, a very profound way is the sort of inherent friction in doing interdisciplinary work. 
Um, and I wonder, I just, I just, again, I, I, I keep asking questions to people like this, but I just want to invite you to speculate on, to talk, <laughs> talk, talk a little bit about that, because I know, I know that's gotta be something you're thinking about because it's exactly what sits underneath these. If, if everyone thinks they're talking about the same thing in the same way, but then they're justifying it in radically different ways, exact, and, and, and the structure of their arguments is significantly different. Yeah. Let me, what, 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 what do you think about that? <laughs> Yes, you're absolutely right. It became um, it became very apparent that our two interdisciplinary journals, the Agriculture Sciencey one, and the Global Environmental Change Social Sciencey one, were very different in the way they approached interdisciplinary work, and we became quite influenced by the work of Barry and Bourne on different kinds of interdisciplinary relations, um, and the. Uh, what I have referred to in this paper as the conciliatory as opposed to the antagonistic. Um, so you, you did have people who are saying we must work together, we must find the answer, and then people who are saying science has got it all wrong, and <laughs> I'm exaggerating to some extent. Um, if you want a personal reaction, I ended up being quite annoyed with social scientists actually, and thought, oh, for goodness sake, get over it. <laughs> we, need, we need the scientific evidence as well as everything else. <laughs> uh, but yes, the, um, that global environmental change um, does have a, it, it has quite a lot of that, I have to be careful here, it has proportionally quite a lot of that discourse but actually also it has a lot of articles that aren't like that. So because of because we were doing um, the figures I've given you today are sort of global figures across the corpus. Um, in, in we, when we have time to go into more detail um, in the book, we what we could do was saying, look, within global environmental change, we can pick out uh, a subset of a few dozen papers which really push this anti-science agenda um, and the uh, a lot of the other papers don't so much so although that is a journal that gives room to that kind of discourse it doesn't necessarily it isn't necessarily the, the the dominant kind of discourse with, even within that journal Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's always an interesting, uh, uh, significant ratios. You always have to remind yourself, right, that 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 that, that you're you're still dealing with what might be a, an an absolute sense of small number. Um, question from uh, uh, from Sarah Davies coming in. This is this is a great question. Uh, extremely interesting to see research writing unpacked. I wonder how this affects your own writing at all. Do you make particular choices in how you write now based on <laughs> based on your findings? Um. Yes, uh, it, yes and no, um, or no and yes. When I write something, I don't think about this. When I go back and reread in the way that you do when you're editing, I start to think, um, I've, I've used this particular, you know, way of way of saying things here, or maybe I, and I'm terribly conscious of whether I'm using the word assumption or hypothesis or. You know, I can agonize for ages over whether something is a notion or a concept or an idea. Um, but I did it uh, in, in my presentation when I was, you know, going over it this morning. I thought, oh, yes, I've used a nominalization on that slide when explaining nominalization. You know? That's great. Uh, another question here from uh, from Catherine Stephen, who asks, uh, did, did your findings tie in with any of your assumptions, predictions, or hypotheses about how language might fit into the, the philosophical approaches or paradigms adopted by various disciplines? Or, or were you surprised by anything when, when you when you started to analyze this this corpus? Um, I, I I know very little about philosophy of science, I have to say. And, um, okay, let me, let me answer that question in two ways. When I started to work on the language of science, which was, I have to say, a very long time ago, probably before large parts of the audience were born, um, 
it was assumed that scientific language was entirely objective and had no subjectivity in it. And that whereas science might have subjectivity because it was the days of Gilbert and Mulcahy investigating discourses in science, contingent and empiricist discourse, it was assumed that when things got to publication, they no longer had any subjectivity in them. And my work was about saying, even this language that looks very objective is actually full of evaluation. So that epistemic status is an evaluation of status. So when you say so-and-so argues that, you are evaluating the proposition as being only somebody's argument and not the truth. Now, I mean, it sounds obvious, but it wasn't so obvious at the time. Um, so I think that was, that was kind of a surprise. Um, but on the other hand, you could say, well, that evaluation is expressed in a way that is consistent with what people say about scientific discourse, which is that it prioritizes the objective. So it's kind of the objectification of the subjective, if you like. Um, when you come to work which compares disciplines, I would say that on the whole, what, would, what you find is what you expect. So if um, the, the work that uh, Maggie Charles did on material science and um, political science, if you start from the position that material science is going to be people do experiments and then other people do the next set of experiments built on the first set of experiments, and we all go in a direct straight line towards the truth. You know? um, whereas political science is going to be, oh, that person said this and I'm going to reinterpret it and I'm going to disagree with it. And that's how social science moves forward. Um, what she found was exactly that. Uh, and so, in a sense, it wasn't a surprise. What she did, of course, was to specify exactly how that happens, putting together each individual material scientist and political scientist and adding them all together. This is, this is, this is how, it, how it works. When we came to the interdisciplinary study, um, we were really batting in the dark. We had no idea what we were going to find. Um, or indeed how we were going to find it. So um, most of what we wrote about it was actually, how do we adapt methodologies to um, um, go into this uh, new thing? But I think it's always, um, it is both disheartening and heartening to find that other people have said the same thing. Um, so when you, uh, you know, you, you find what you think is wonderful and then you discover that, um, you know, some philosopher of science has already said this, but they've, they've said it in a general way. And what you're doing is saying, yes, and this is how, you know, when people sit there putting pen to paper or fingertip to keys, um, this is the mechanism by which what you've observed happens. Sorry, I don't know if that answers the question. I seem to have gone on for a long time. <laughs> no, no, that, that's really, that's really nice. Thanks. Um, next question coming in. I guess a question from, uh, from Christoph Malter who asks, uh, who says, thanks so much for the talk. Um, I was very interested in the markers of epistemic status that you mentioned, uh, in the middle of your talk. Did you identify and quantify them by close reading or through text mining methods? Also, uh, did you develop up front a list of such markers that you specifically searched for? So he says in a work in progress, we started developing a list of those kinds of markers, but it looks like we're maybe reinventing the wheel. <laughs> well, um, what, because when the markers are nouns or verbs or adjectives, they are always, I say with inverted commas, because you always have to have inverted commas around always, don't you? Um, they are predominantly words which can be followed by that clauses, what I, what I call those as positive that clauses. So things like it shows that the idea that it is clear that all of those words are followed by that clauses. Now in some work that was done not to do with science at all but in the field of lexicography back in the 1990s um, with colleagues um, we produced actually 
believe it or not, lists of all the words in all those grammatical patterns in English. Um, I, can, I can send you the reference for that if, if really you're you know, wanting ways of getting to sleep. Um, but we, but the, the good news about that was that we ended up with a list of words, verbs, nouns, and adjectives that are followed by a positive back clauses. And we could then do a search. And I didn't actually do this, but it was Paul Thompson who somehow magically, you know, did some kind of algorithm that found in the corpus all those words, whether or not they were followed by a that clause, because that's also quite important. Um, so I can follow that up offline if that's of interest. So it wouldn't get everything because it wouldn't get adverbs, for example, um, but it would get most things. Let me just piggyback on that just because I'm, I'm interested in something that came up in the, in the context of your answer. Um, what, what do you see? What, 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 what is the meaning you ascribe to the use of those terms when they don't get followed up by a positive vet clause? Oh, well, very often um, they are um, uh, anaphoric. So it would be um, one of the examples I have that I can't be bothered to find now um, was things like the implication of these findings is that. So if you only search for implication followed by that, you won't pick up that, um, that example. But also you've got the phrase, these findings, which refers anaphorically to previous sentence, paragraph, whatever, even a different paper. Um, but they're still um, indicating the status of the thing being referred to. So this is why we do things, it's a different notion from signaling nouns where the referent has to be in the immediate surroundings. This is where it's a bit different. You will always pick up some false positives. Um, I mean, we had to be very careful with the word perception, which is sometimes uh, in plant science, for example, the perception was often um, just, well, plants don't perceive, do they? Anyway, whatever it was, I can't remember now, but it was, um, it was people and animals perceiving as opposed to my perception of this is that. <laughs> right, right, yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's, good. that's, that, that's funny. Um... Oh, yes, a question here from, from Eugenio Petrovich, who asks, uh, uh, do your findings about scientific language match up with the advice that one might find in a manual of professional scientific writing? So is there is there a training, uh, a training and formation uh, question here? Sorry, I cut my own mic too early. <laughs> um, uh, more generally, uh, kind of yes and no. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I think I have to say, this is not a study that I've carried out, although it, I know people have made comments on this. And it, the comments are very often along the lines of uh, people writing scientific papers use I much more than style guides tell them to. Um, so that's always the, uh, the uh, advice that's offered. I do find, because I work a lot with PhD students who are writing theses, and um, one thing I find is I am constantly telling them, be careful which, um, which report verb you use. There is a big difference between saying uh, somebody says that and somebody insists that, and somebody claims that, um, these are not, you know, you've gone to your dictionary and you've found a whole load of words that you think mean the same thing. They don't mean the same thing. Be careful in your choice of word. When it comes to nominalization and grammatical metaphor, I find sometimes I'm telling students, um, this sentence is too difficult. Make it simpler by changing the nouns to verbs. And then the other half of that time, I'm saying this sentence sounds too simplistic, make it better by changing the verbs to nouns. So, you know, I'm a terrible person to have as a supervisor. <laughs> yeah, that, that actually 
I wanted to, uh, uh, this is an inchoate question, but I wanted to ask something about this, about this, this metaphor uh, uh, idea, because this, this also, of course, lines up with, as, as I'm sure you, as I'm sure you know, at this point, at least in, 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 a, in a glancing way, a lot of literature in, in the philosophy of science, thinking about conceptual foundations, what it means to, to, to construct theories, structures of theories, and this, this kind of thing. And I'm really interested by the, exactly this idea that this might be a process that is sort of corpus level visible, if you will. Mm. Um, and so that, I guess, one, one way to ask this question would be to say, where does that kind of work get done in your experience? So you found that in these interdisciplinary, you found a lot of this, of, of this, this, the differences in language patterns, more abstract, less concrete type interactions in an interdisciplinary context. And that makes, that makes good sense. Um, have you picked up, for instance, sort of self-reflectively more theoretical journals? Do people do the same kind of thing in those sorts of contexts? Like, where can we catch scientists? If, if, if plant science is just filled with, you know, and then I cut the plant into tiny pieces and I put it under the microscope, where can we catch scientists doing more of this, uh, uh, this more abstract work? No, I think, I think this grammatical metaphor is everywhere. Um, and... Um, I mean, it wasn't something that we looked at specifically in our project, but I can pick you any, you know, you pick up any journal on any topic, any academic journal, and it'll be just crammed full of this, uh, of, of grammatical metaphor. It really is um, absolutely pervasive. Uh, I mean, I bought a, 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 an issue of The New Scientist, and and that's not an academic you know, it's it's not an academic journal, but still, as soon as scientists write, they're into the grammatical metaphor. You just can't get away from it. And Halliday talks about this. Uh, he talks about it in the context of scientists complaining that English doesn't have the resources they need to express the vibrancy and the organic progression of their discipline. So, so I'm quoting him now. Um, he says that scientists say uh, English doesn't allow me to talk about the, uh, the process driven nature of my discipline. And he says, well, actually, it could do if you use if you didn't use a scientific style when you're writing. <laughs> What's happened is that scientists themselves have changed English. And instead of using it in a verb dominated way, they're using it in a noun dominated way. And he uses the, he uses the metaphor of crystalline versus, versus choreographic style. Uh, he actually also uses two Greek words, Attic and Doric, but I can never remember which one is which, so I don't use those. The crystalline is where everything is very static and that's where you go noun, noun, noun. And the choreographic is when it goes verb, 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 and you so you've got more clauses and shorter noun phrases. But it's worth reading Halliday on that because he says it. He says what I've said, but a lot better. It's really interesting. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely, I'll definitely pick that up. Um, oh, qu good question from from coming in from Christoph Maliter, who asks. Uh, which is it? Let me, let me, I'm even going to broaden his question a little bit and then I'll ask it exactly as he wrote it. But let me start by asking, so just have you, have you applied this kind of analysis as well to humanities research uh, so, uh, uh, as, a, as a separate kind of journal, journal writing? So he asks, you know, I says, I wonder whether the metaphoric versus congruent properties of discourse would pick up a marked difference or not between the classic uh, distinction between continental and analytic philosophy or between sort of older styles in humanities research versus versus current style that uh, people often accuse us of sort of having become more scientific in in recent years in our journal writing. Um, no, is the short answer. Um, um, haven't done that. Um, I do find writing in the humanities fascinating and uh, I think certainly should be studied. Um, I do have a colleague who's worked on something similar in relation to comparing um, history with English literature journals and, and showing a, a difference between the two. Um, I can only say that 
<laughs> say again, grammatical metaphor is everywhere. Um, and um, uh, whether you look at history or anything else, um, it, it is absolutely there. But actually quantifying it, um, no, I, I don't know. And that suggestion about the two different kinds of philosophy uh, would make a very interesting study, I think. So thank you for the suggestion. Very cool. Oh, and another uh, 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 sort of, uh, oh, this is, yeah, the good question. So another question from, from, from Christoph as well. So this, this bridges a bit back to the, the question about, about training, although here from a different direction. So do you know whether there's been any work maybe in psychology linking um, um, the way that people produce these kinds of, uh, these kinds of grammars to, to, to uh, personality traits or, or uh, other characteristics of, of authors, of the, of the people themselves? Um, again, the short answer is no. Um, I don't know whether any work has been done, and I certainly don't know of any work like that that's been done. Um, there has been work on different cultures. So there are, um, I know there are papers comparing, for example, um, uh, people from China writing in English and uh, their use of um, kind of epi markers of epistemic status um, and linking the differences between that and a similar group of um, people from the US, the UK writing in English um, and linking that to perceived uh, cultural differences. But individuals, I, don't, I, be, I would be surprised if there were individual differences just because these things get, tend to get knocked out of one by editor review and reviewers and, and, and things like that. Yeah, strong, strong homogenizing effect of the <laughs> discipline for sure. Yeah. Um, oh, I had a question from uh, from Beckett Sterner who asks. Uh, uh, so I'm curious how the rise of uh, big databases like WordNet, which get used heavily in in computer science, can interact with more fine grained studies of terminology and linguistic patterns. So, have you seen uh, good examples of how expert analysis can augment or improve some of these more big data based uh, uh, lexical knowledge uh, uh, resources? Um, I think there's been a little bit on improving WordNet by including. Um, phrases because one of the things that comes out of the kind of work that we've that's been done um, in corpus linguistics is the importance of phrases rather than words that meanings belong to phrases and not to words um, so there's been the, that influence um, I think a, but sometimes the view is that wordnet starts from the wrong you know I wouldn't start from here therefore I'm not going to improve it kind of kind of thing that yeah that's a <laughs> that's always a risk um let's see let me see if there are any other questions coming in over the chat at the moment i don't see any so i will um will i self-indulge again i probably shouldn't i'll stall instead <laughs> okay i'll be I'll be, uh, I'll be, I'll be self-indulgent one more time. Um, one, so, so, so that actually this, this, this connects a little bit to something we were, that was just, was just being mentioned. Um, I wonder to what extent you think so, so, so how much of this, uh, these changes in patterns in, in, uh, epistemic status markers, um, I guess what I'm trying to what I'm trying to grasp my way towards is a question about is a question about causation. That is to say, so why what what exactly is it giving rise to the difference? That is to say, is it that the scientists themselves genuinely have something that they want to express that they're really trying to? This is this is what they actually believe is the uh, uh, it's the epistemic attitude that they really have toward the proposition in their head. Um, is it more sort of uh, you know? 
discipline membership signaling? Is it really being uh, uh, pushed in by editors or even copy editors um, in the in the journal publication process? Do you have any any sense for sort of how to uh, the, you know, the publication process is long and complex and, and thorny, and, and I wonder if you have any sense about breaking it down into its smaller parts. I think to know that for certain, you'd have to do a study of drafting and redrafting. And I've seen that done, I, I, uh, a colleague of mine did that on um, MA dissert master's dissertations and ha what happened as students rewrote their draft after draft of their master's dissertation. And uh, there were all obviously all sorts of changes. This was one of them, that they changed the way that they expressed their attitude towards the propositions that, that they were writing. Um, but I don't know, I don't know of any uh, study that's been done um, broader scale on that. Um, it would be interesting. I, I like to believe that people express it because they that's what they think because that's what that's what they mean um uh so choosing to say um so you know somebody shows that uh means that you are aligning yourself with that view uh you can't say so and so shows that and they're wrong it's got to be they show that and therefore they are right. It's like saying, um, uh, as, so as, as Darwin says, you can't then disagree with Darwin. <laughs> um, so I like to think that people are in control of what they're doing and that they don't change that because some editor has told them. Um, the exception to that, of course, is uh, this is an international process. And um, I, I was talking to a writer who had quoted me and said Hunston claims that and I said oh so you mean I'm wrong then <laughs> they said, well no 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 I just meant <laughs> it just meant um argues that so these things are always you know these meanings are not as fixed as as sometimes we pretend they are yeah that's that's true yeah that I I I'm sure we could have a whole separate conversation, actually something that's come up a few times, you know, several times over the course of the conference so far, this idea of, of internationalization by and multilingualism, the questions of translation, of course, that's just a whole, that's a whole separate can of worms for another day, unfortunately, as we are at this point out of time. Uh, thank you so much. This was, this was really fantastic. I, I really very